Hi, I'm Barbara Mills. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, <laughs> I think I know almost everybody in the room now. And I'm, I'm, uh, it's my pleasure to talk about uh, the field school that we have uh, in the Silver Creek and uh, also Forestdale Valley. And uh, this is termed collaborative archaeology, and I thought maybe the good thing to do would be to define what collaborative archaeology means. And to us, collaborative archaeology uh, means that uh, the research design was uh, developed by, equally by the people who were, we were working with. And in our case, uh, our main partners were the U.S. Forest Service and Sipri's National Forest, as well as the White Mountain Apache Tribe. So uh, this is a collaboration between uh, those institutions and the University of Arizona Archaeological Field School. And I wanted to point out, um, this is Kanishba. This is the field school students stabilizing the walls that Cummings reconstructed after he excavated the site. So I just wanted to uh, make sure everybody uh, knew what that was. So the uh, field school was at Pinedale, uh, which was our camp, our base, from 1993 to 1997. Then I took a break to do some write-up with uh, a couple of our very uh, excellent uh, graduate students, Sarah Herr and Scott Van Curen, uh, so that we could write up uh, five years of work. Uh, and th then we went back out uh, from 1999 to 2000. I took a break to write a grant proposal with John Welch, which was the NSF uh, Research Experiences for Undergraduates uh, portion. And then we went back out for three years. So here you can see the location of Silver Creek. And I just wanted to highlight what the reasons why we chose that area for the field school. Uh, when I was first hired here, I was kind of given carte blanche to move the field school anywhere I wanted to, except staying at Grasshopper. <laughs> so, Grasshopper is down here. And uh, so I chose the Silver Creek drainage uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them was near Hay Hollow Valley, where some of uh, the new archaeology was done, especially by Professor Longacre. Uh, it was also between uh, Chevron and Grasshopper, you can see here a little bit better, uh, the Hamalabi cluster uh, near Chevron, the Grasshopper cluster here, the Mishpa cluster, and another cluster of very well-known Pueblo four sites that had not been researched uh, since Howry had been there. It was also still up in the Pines, which I was led to believe was a, a prerequisite for archaeological <laughs> field schools. Uh, we were following, uh, of course, in the footsteps of uh, Abel's work uh, in, uh, in How and, and, uh, and Lyndon Hargrave, who worked in the Silver Creek area. Of course, finding the Rosetta Stone of Southwest Percy history at Sholo Ruin or Whipple Ruin over here. Uh, they also excavated at uh, Pinedale Ruin. So this provided some baseline uh, work for us to be able to uh, follow up on. I was also very interested, having come off of the Chaco Project surveys, in Chaco Outliers. Uh, many of you may have heard of uh, Chaco Outliers. So uh, this is the most up-to-date map that we have now for uh, a current project that I'm directing, the Southwest Social Networks Chaco uh, Networks Project, and the showing the distribution of all Chacoan outliers and circular great kivas. And you'll notice that there's this very intense blue concentration of circular gray kivas uh, in the southwestern portion. Well, some of those uh, we have known about, uh, in part because of Walter Huff's work. And I had seen this plan. I pulled it off the shelf as I was thinking about where I wanted to do my field school. And I saw this plan. I said, boy, that sure looks awfully planned and regular. It looks like a, like a Chaco outlier with that huge structure. It might be even a bywall structure. And then uh, after I started the field school, uh, we realized that Walter Huff had kind of made this look a little too perfect. <laughs> and we found his original field notes, and that's why it really <laughs> uh, Sarah Herr, fortunately, uh, with the survey crew, was able to find it because Huff not only had misdrawn it, he had also mislocated it in his publications. He said it was two miles to the east of Linden when it was, in fact, two miles to the southwest. Uh, so uh, we ended up. Um, excuse me, um, looking for it, oh, I have another slide coming up, and finding it in, in some of the other areas uh, that we finally were able to uh, um, survey. Well, the field school goals that we had were to uh, uh, do teaching, of course, research, you no know, different from previous uh, field schools, um, although I think we added on a little bit more in terms of collaboration. Um, you've heard a little bit about the oral history work that was done, 
uh, in some of the, of the grasshopper research. However, um, ours was um, <coughs> focused more on the collaboration side and also on preservation. We didn't want to excavate huge numbers of rooms and, and also have huge numbers of objects to curate. So we tried to be a, a, a dig a little bit slower. <laughs> I would have failed. Uh, Dr. Thompson would have called me into his office and said, you're digging much too slow. <laughs> but here you can see some of uh, the uh, folks who have worked with us and how um, we organized uh, survey, excavations, and then also stabilization as part of our activities. We had to establish a camp uh, at Pinedale. Fortunately, the Forest Service that we, who we were collaborating with uh, was uh, very forthcoming in allowing us to use an historic uh, ranger station, uh, the Pinedale Camp, which is on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, this is the old barn where our laboratory was. In the back, we have had all of our processing areas where we washed the shirts. We hung up our macrobot samples in pink chiffon <laughs> on the line. We had uh, seminars uh, there, and uh, uh, one of our famous uh, field school students, Sarah Lucetta, uh, uh, Dr. Thompson's granddaughter, is giving her paper to the crew uh, at the end of the season. We moved the cabins from Grasshopper, which originally uh, Professor Longacre had built, which I understand were basically on the plan of a doghouse, and then were blown up <laughs> to fit two people, two cots, that is. <laughs> with a shelf in between. Uh, the ranger station headquarters where the, uh, park, the, the uh, Forest Service ranger was stationed was empty, so we were able to take that over for my living quarters initially and because there was no room for me in the staff quarters uh, over to the right. And then we, when we did have room in those uh, staff quarters, I was able to uh, turn that into a uh, office for the students so they could charge those cell phones that they weren't supposed to have. <laughs> Here you can see uh, the location of the sites that we excavated. Here's the Mugion Rim. Here's the Forestdale Valley where we worked for three years. We kept our camp at Pinedale and we commuted to each one of these, sometimes taking an hour, hour and a half each way depending on the weather. All of the tree ring dates for the Mugion Rim uh, uh, area were compiled in our uh, report that we published in 1999, we originally thought that the lack of tree ring dates here might mean that there was discontinuous occupation. However, when we excavated Hall Point and got back the radiocarbon dates, uh, we found out that a couple of structures helped to fill in these gaps. And it's probably a very low uh, <coughs> level of occupation, but not necessarily discontinuous through the whole time period. You can see how much the tree ring record increases after AD uh, 1050 or so, and that's largely because of the concentration of excavations on the late great sites. Paul Point, this early site with uh, many pit structures may be considered to be a persistent place on the landscape. It overlaps a little bit with the uh, Bluff Ruin, uh, and then a little bit with the Bear Ruin in Forestdale Valley. Not as deep of these uh, structured uh, deposits, though, as certainly not as deep as blood ruin, uh, which is also on top of the hill. So this is a really good example of people going back to a pit house period site. The Great Kiva sites uh, that we uh, located on survey uh, then became the subject of Sarah Hur's dissertation research. Uh, we excavated at all the ones here that you see in blue. Uh, Climb Point was a little bit later, and I'll talk about why we did that. Catherine's Kiva is an example. These are unroofed great kivas, and the double wall is actually a berm, which has a bench a little bit lower. So these are not the great kivas that you think about, like Kazov and Kamana, but they are great. They're huge, and they have high walls around them. Uh, they usually have a, an entryway on the southeastern side. Huff's Great Kiva, the, the infamous one that Huff uh, mislocated for us, uh, was found by the survey crew up on the right. We saw a slide of Ava Watt. Uh, Ava uh, came and visited our field school uh, while we were excavating out there. She maintained uh, an interest in the University of Arizona's activities. And in this case, she was accompanied by Ramon Riley, who is the director of the White Mountain Apache Museum uh, in White River. The sites that we excavated span uh, different time periods, allowing us to look at diachronic uh, variability over time. Uh, 
Uh, one of the later sites is Pottery Hill. Here you can see it's a little bit bigger. Sites are bigger, more aggregated uh, as people are coalescing. And this site dates essentially to the uh, early um, Pueblo III period, or excuse me, middle Pueblo III period, about 1200 to 1275. Uh, it has a kiva and a plaza and a ceremonial room. We excavated a very small site called Riot Ranch, which is a burned structure uh, similar to some of the burned structures that you find throughout the Mogollon Mountains. Uh, this site we did as a collaboration with the Hopi <coughs> tribe and Philip Tuolestua, who was director of the Hopi uh, land office and a former assistant director of NOAA, was my co-PI on the MGS project and came out with his crew uh, to do uh, a GPS uh, and the uh, final map. Like uh, some of the sites in the Mogollon Mountains, lots and lots of pots on the floor, but not a single one is a whole pot. We excavated or screened every single uh, inch of deposits. We trenched around the outside. We looked at the midden, and we did not find that any of these were reconstructable. Uh, they were reconstructable, but none of them were 100% complete. So people left behind the pots that were all used up when they left. Not exactly uh, the kind of uh, 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 Pompeii that you, that you might hope for. Bailey Ruin, uh, it's the latest site that we excavated, 1275 to 1325. Although I have to say that Scott Van Curen, who was one of our uh, prime staff members, especially early in the project, took up the mantle of the late, later couple of four period sites uh, after we uh, stopped our excavations. Here are a couple of examples of the rooms we excavated. Uh, you can see it's about 200 to 250 ground uh, story rooms. I wanted to point out one of the uh, field school students, Vernelda Grant, uh, who is now the uh, Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the San Carlos Apache Tribe and was one of our students uh, at, at Bailey Room. So as I said, we, um, we uh, did a five-year project. We took a year off to write up the results. Uh, we did a two-volume uh, summary which had the analytical as well as the descriptive chapters. Uh, the, this cover art was, is by Doug Gann, uh, who is currently at ARC Southwest. And I'm very grateful to Doug because he was at the field school the very first year as a, uh, as a TA. Some of the students learned in 1993 how to do GIS with very, very early software. Uh, some of the students went on to do great things, like Jason Orr, who is now an associate professor at Harvard and is doing incredible things with GIS that he attributes to his education at the field school. So this, the last uh, couple of uh, three years that we uh, excavated uh, was very, very small-scale excavation. And that was in part because we started this collaboration with the White Mountain Apache tribe. And our goal was to work with them and for them to set the agenda, the research agenda. So we asked them, as we were uh, working on thinking about uh, what we wanted to do for the last few years, uh, what they needed to have done. And John Welch was my co-PI, and he talked to folks in the museum, uh, with people in various offices at uh, White Mountain. And they said that uh, what they needed was a survey of the Forestdale Valley. So boy, was I excited, because this is one of the most beautiful valleys in uh, East Central Arizona. And we developed a, the, the research design. We submitted to NSF, uh, along with a, a letter of um, accompaniment by the uh, White Mountain Apache tribe. And we uh, got funded, and we were able to do this for, for the, you know, 2002 through 2004. So here you can see, uh, here's our camp. Uh, the highway runs down here. Uh, here's the Forestdale Valley, and here, in respect to Kanishpa and Fort Apache. Forestdale Valley, of course, was where Howry had his field school for several years, excavating at the Bear Ruin, which you see on the left, and on the upper right, uh, Tlaki on the lower right. One of the things that his graduate students did was to conduct a survey of the Forestdale Valley. So many of the sites were already known and were in the site records at the Arizona State Museum uh, and then went into as site. But the locations of those had not been uh, GPS, had not been done in uh, modern standards. So one of the goals that we had was to be able to come up with a correspondence of the sites uh, in the Forestdale Valley uh, with our own survey. So we did a 100% survey of three square kilometers of Dr. Kelly Jenks, um, who just 
uh, moved to uh, New Mexico State uh, University uh, is shown in, when she was a student uh, at the field school uh, doing survey and collections. We were allowed to do collections. We were able to bring everything back to the lab here in Tucson, do the analysis, and then those collections were returned to the, the tribe. Uh, you can see here the beautiful valley. However, the terrain gets much more rugged as you get to the edges. Each student, every year that we did the field school, uh, including these three years, had to do a project. Uh, one of the projects is shown on the right, which was a tour guide for uh, the fourth through sixth graders uh, at, um, in the, the uh, Fort Apache school districts. Another one of the activities that we did was to assess the damage uh, that had been done to two of the largest sites. One of them is known as the Forestdale Ruin, and the other one is Tunis Tusa. Uh, we mapped each of those sites, which had never really gotten a proper map, and uh, Chuck Riggs, who was uh, on the staff at the beginning of the field school and then came back as assistant director for this uh, REU, ran the mapping team and did uh, two beautiful maps. Uh, the one of Tunis Tusa is on the right, showing also where every single pothole uh, was. And we were able to uh, uh, excavate, not excavate, but um, collect the material from the looters pits, take them back to the lab uh, in Pinedale, wash them, analyze them, and then we brought them back, put them into the bottom of the pits. Then at the end of the season at both Forestdale and Tunis Tusa, it took us three years to do both sites, uh, we brought clean sand in and covered up each one of those looters pits. Uh, it, a couple of Apache folks would always come by because there's a spring there that a lot of people like to get water and they would come up and kind of check us out and, and uh, ask us what we were doing. And, and uh, we'd say, well, we're archaeologists from the University of Arizona. And they would say, well, how come you're filling up the pits and not digging the pits? <laughs> so we explained what we were doing. They seemed to find that. Uh, half of the archaeological sites that we found were, in fact, uh, historic Apache sites in the valley. These became the subject of Lauren Jelinek's uh, master's thesis. Um, and uh, here you can see Lauren uh, interviewing uh, Paul Ethelbaugh at his ranch. So we, it's sort of like ethnoarchaeology. We got to ask uh, the owners of the architecture uh, what they um, had used them for. Uh, Jeff Dean, in fact, came out uh, with Paul's blessing to core the beams in the uh, in this uh, structure here. Uh, Paul also told us exactly when this agave roasting pit was used. It was used for uh, a member of his family's um, uh, ceremony, uh, a female coming of age ceremony. Uh, John, here's John Welch, uh, and then another one of our uh, undergraduates who's doing an oral history for one of the projects. So this was a very satisfying part of the project, was to be able to do these interviews which remain in the archive. We were able to bring many individuals from different tribes, from Hopi, from Zuni, uh, as well as from White Mountain, uh, up uh, to the camp several times over the course of each summer. Uh, so here's uh, Cornelia Hoffman, uh, her daughter, Sunshine, and then Mark Altaha, who came every year. Mark is uh, the <coughs> individual who replaced John Welch uh, in the Historic Preservation Program. Uh, Ramon Riley came back every year. Here he is with his wife, uh, the director of the museum. And then we also had, uh, here's the Hopi uh, cultural resources team who would come and visit us uh, to see what we were doing. And it just uh, um, turned out that Ben Nabumsa, who was the BIA superintendent at Fort Apache, was a Hopi tribal member and would also take that opportunity to come out and tour the sites uh, with uh, the group. Uh, T.J. Ferguson was in charge of what we call the ethics component, uh, which allowed the students to read uh, ethics case studies to learn about some of the ethical dilemmas about doing archaeology in the post nagra era. Uh, the graduate students uh, were the judges, of, and the students did with many ethics bowls. The graduate students got so enthused that they started their own ethics bowl team and competed at the Society for American Archaeology that following spring and won first place. <laughs> uh, there's always a little bit of a downside to archaeological uh, field work. Uh, we've been touching on the lighter moments, I think, but I uh, just wanted to 
uh, mentioned this was pretty defining uh, moment, uh, 10 days into my first year at the, of the REU, <coughs> to have the Rodeo Cheteskai fire break out. Mm. Uh, uh, Jeff Dean, Carol, Carol Gifford, and Art Jelinek were all visiting that day. Uh, we saw the plume from the Forestdale Valley. Uh, we went to visit uh, uh, a group uh, of some of our excavators. We went back to camp at lunch, uh, and there was ash falling on us. And we uh, and were told that we had four hours uh, to evacuate when we were out visiting our students. When we got back and after lunch, we were told we had 45 minutes. So the fire moved pretty fast. Everybody was evacuated. We had a backup plan. Always have a backup plan. <laughs> Evacuation plan. Everybody had their wallets, everybody had um, all their ID, uh, but they didn't have their cars, they didn't have their clothing, they didn't have a lot of things. Half of our crews did not make it back to camp for 10 more days, 13 more days. Um, and I just have to do a special shout out um, to the crew uh, who was with me that summer because uh, we went through quite a, quite a uh, ordeal uh, going to the uh, evacuation center and then going on the road and then back here to Tucson for another week at the very end. I gave everybody $100, and I said, go and spend, buy your meals, <laughs> and put them up in dorms, and uh, lots and lots of people here in this room came and gave the best lectures. You know, the papers that summer were the best papers they ever did, because they had access to the library, they had access to the computer, uh, the GIS lab, uh, and of course, the bonding that went on. Four of the students, out of the 16 that we had that summer, applied to and were accepted to the University of Arizona for graduate school. Uh, and I, it was just a really great summer. So the next summer, the Forest Service decided what we were going to do, <laughs> which was to go into the burned areas. Uh, so this is a, a site, uh, a view from Klein Point of what the devastation looked like. If we were allowed to drive in, we had to wear hard hats from here up the path, in between the trees, up to the top of the site. Uh, that summer, though, uh, we excavated uh, in the burned areas because the burning had basically taken out the roots that were holding the site together. Uh, so the roots burned out, things were collapsing. We were brought in to help excavate, to help stabilize a little bit. Uh, so what we did at the uh, end of the summer was to bring in huge bales of straw, reseed, and then the next summer when we visited, you can see what that effect was. It was really uh, quite um, a good feeling to see the, uh, the grasses coming up, the wildflowers, holding the archaeological site um, together. I don't have time to talk about all the research, really, but I'm just going to hit just a few slides to, as a highlight. First of all, following up, uh, starting with uh, Sarah Furr's uh, research, which was published as an anthro paper, we realized that the Mogollon Rim region is, is an area betwixt and between. Uh, it was between Chaco and Hoakam in the Chaco <coughs> period and the, uh, the uh, late pre-classic period of Hoakam. But it's renamed that in that position throughout the, its history. So really, to understand that area, we need to understand the surrounding areas. Uh, one of the things that uh, is important for understanding the area is the late migration, uh, late 13th century migration into the Silver Creek and through the Silver Creek area to other areas. Patrick showed the examples of white outlining. Here it is on the Keats Seal polychrome. Pinedale polychrome is basically a reproduction of uh, a, you know, that kind of Keats Seal white outlining, um, white mountain red wear, and then of course we get it down in the, in the Pines and San Pedro areas on Maverick Mountain polychrome. The role of skilled migrants and community specialization. The Silver Creek area has excellent clays. Skilled migrants moved in from the Canta area. They were skilled in pottery. They were skilled in weaving, in agriculture. Uh, these, the sites in the Silver Creek cluster essentially became community specialists, supplying pots to many people below the Mogollon Rim where those clays were not available. Uh, Scott Van Curen's very important work looking at these later types has shown um, how some of those specialists continue to produce outstanding work. And here are some more examples. Uh, this, this is a, one of my favorites, a big feasting bowl uh, with textile designs on the inside. This, the, the migrants brought glaze paint. Actually, they invented, they innovated glaze paint. But they didn't bring it from anywhere else. It was a new innovation to the Rugby and Rim region that then spread to Zuni and then to the Rio Grande area. <coughs> 
The genesis of Roosevelt Redware is also in the Silver Creek area. Susan Stinson's master's thesis uh, was able to demonstrate this. And here you can see the Pinto polycom, which is an early form. Uh, later forms uh, have a lot of decoration on the outside, uh, but the earliest uh, tree ring dated uh, white, uh, excuse me, Roosevelt Redware uh, is from right above the rim, as well as a site very close to Grasshopper that uh, Jeff uh, didn't mention, chose not. <coughs> And then we also have these benefits of, that we were able to provide to the White Mountain Apache tribe. Um, the first was the documentation of damage to cultural resources at two of the largest sites. Uh, second is training of indigenous and non-indigenous students in the ethics of archaeology in the 21st century. Uh, the full coverage survey that we, uh, we did, we turned over to the tribe and is now uh, in their, uh, their records and, uh, and they're able to access each one of those uh, site uh, records as well as collections. We did a correlation of all of Howley's sites to the best that we could uh, so that the records that he produced are now more accessible. And then um, finally, uh, we have educational materials for use in schools and fairs that we were able to produce for the tribe. And then finally, I just want to close with the benefits to indigenous archaeology. Um, our first two PhDs in archaeology from the School of Anthropology are Nick Lauer and Carrie Thompson. Nick was a uh, student at the university, at, at the field school, and Carrie was one of our staff members. And um, I just want to uh, point out how uh, proud we are to have them as our alumni now. But all work and no play makes for a dull field school, and I'm sorry that Tishy and Donnie can't be here to see themselves wearing funny hats. <laughs> Or, uh, or the Buckles, as we call them, uh, Abby Buckles and Kristen Hagen Buckle, who met at the field school and got married. <laughs> um, here, having a little bit of a tussle with buckets, not buckles. <laughs> and thanks very much to everybody. <laughs>